a long time ago in a state far, far away in what seems like another lifetime, I was the research assistant and study coordinator for the world's preeminent researcher of nuts. <laughs> I speak, of course, of almonds, walnuts, and pecans. Four years of my life were dedicated to getting this phrase approved by the FDA and put on every single can of nuts that you buy today. Scientific evidence suggests, but does not prove, apparently our studies were too small, that eating 1.5 ounces per day of nuts as part of a diet low in saturated fat and cholesterol may reduce the risk of heart disease. Our studies revealed a few different things. One of the things we found was that when you eat nuts, it increases your satiety, your feeling of fullness. So if you snack on nuts, you may eat less calories overall as opposed to some other snack food. We found that nuts reduce LDL cholesterol, improving your lipid panel. And we even began to discover that when you eat nuts, uh, almonds in particular in this case, your endothelial function is improved. That's the response that your veins, the inner walls of the veins as blood pumps do, how quickly they spring back and forth. Well, this was exciting to my boss, the world's preeminent researcher of nuts. Uh, we wrote a few book chapters, we wrote several um, scholarly articles in, in peer-reviewed journals, and then people started coming to us, industries, marketers, and they wanted to know what was it inside the nut that could, we could attribute this benefit from. Was it the arginine, the lysine, the, the vitamin E, the folic acid? These are different things that are, that are in the nut. And uh, to the dismay of these people <laughs> who would call and email, and actually some actually came to Loma Linda to visit us, to their dismay, we weren't able to identify one component that would be responsible for the health benefit. What we found, and in the end, what we were able to determine that nuts are a functional food. And uh, in the nutrition world, that means, that that's to say that the health benefits of nuts go way beyond the nutrients they contain. In other words, the whole food, the whole nut, in mysterious fashion, has an exponentially greater effect on your health than the sum of any of its parts. You can't isolate it, you can't put it in a pill or a powder. You have to eat the whole thing. And the whole thing is much greater than any of the individual pieces. Let's pray this morning. Dear Lord, we come together this morning to spend just a few minutes discussing a vitally important topic. We have to do it a uh, center spirit to speak to us. Knock down these fumes from this carpet, Lord, that we may stay awake and alert during this message. Amen. Do you smell that? I smell it. If I see you falling out, I'm going to attribute that to the carpet today and not to the preaching. Today is the fourth sermon in a five-part series on the core values of Triad Adventist Fellowship. And uh, Matt has done so well to present the last few weeks on spiritual growth, authenticity, and grace. And uh, he was going to preach one more today, but I saw his sermon notes and we had to give him the hook. <laughs> Um, because today we're talking about unity. And when I saw Matt's notes, his idea of unity uh, was something to the effect of, we all do whatever he says, and then we be united. And uh, <laughs> now, you know, it, it would be a benevolent dictatorship, but a dictatorship nonetheless. So sorry, Matt, we're going we're gonna to go a different direction today. And so I wonder, what is unity? You know, this is one of those words, if you spend any time in a church, that you hear knocked around a lot. We, we use words, righteousness, sanctification, unity, and, and sometimes we use them so much that we're not actually sure what we're talking about. It just sounds good to say it. Um, so what is unity? Uh, it's more than just simple agreement or everybody doing the same thing. We're not talking about becoming clones. And no matter, uh, biblical unity does not mean coerced conformity. Uh, by definition, if you look up unity in your uh, dictionary, if you still have one of those, uh, it can mean a few different things. It can mean a condition of harmony, and we have biblical examples of that. You think in the early church, the book of Acts, it says they were all in one accord. They were all of one mind there, in harmony. It can mean the quality of being made into one, 
Uh, you think of uh, the unification of a country, or maybe, like in Germany's case a few decades ago, the reunification of a, company, a country. Or it can mean the totality of related parts, like a nut that we just talked about. In this case, each individual component remains unique, has its own individual aspects, but together they come together and form a whole unit that works together to achieve a greater purpose. And that's the definition we want to look at this morning. Because it kind of explains the idea that the core group had when we chose unity to be part of our core values. We weren't looking for a situation where everybody would be thinking and acting the same all the time. But we wanted to have a situation where people could be themselves and yet work together towards a common good and a common goal. We said at the outset of this uh, fellowship, uh, the very first week that I preached, we had our table of truth. And we said that at the center of that table of truth would, would rest the amazing love of God. The distinguishing factor of this fellowship is not that we all have the same beliefs, although most of those are common, but it's that we aspire to live in unity and love for each other. Beliefs are vitally important, so don't go away not hearing that if you weren't here to hear me explain it the first few weeks. But our beliefs need to be rooted in that capital T truth that God is love. And our scriptural foundation several weeks ago for this came from uh, the greatest commandment. God, uh, Jesus said to love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. And also from 1 John where it reads, Dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God. So we talked about you can know all the doctrines intellectually, but if you don't have love in your heart for God and for people, something's lacking there. I remind us of all this because it's God's love that provides for our unity. And it's no surprise that unity is a frequent subject or concept that we find in the scriptures. Um, when I begin, well, let me, let me just be authentic as Matt it's a challenge us to be. Typically, when you prepare a sermon, it should come from your study of the word, and you begin to look at a passage and you wrestle with that. When we come to these five weeks and say we're going to preach on these topics, that kind of upsets the formation of a sermon in a little bit of a way. Because then we have a topic and we're going to the scripture to try to find how that works. So I'm trying to be intellectually honest. I'm trying to do that. And, uh, you know, Paul has a lot to say about unity. And I looked at some of those scriptures. But what I found in, in, in a lot of Paul's writing is... While he speaks of unity, he very rarely defines exactly what he's talking about. So I went searching a little further, and I came to the Gospel of John, the 17th chapter. And uh, we're going to read a pretty good portion of that chapter. And the 17th chapter of John, Jesus is coming to the end of his earthly ministry. And we have here what we might call the real Lord's Prayer. <laughs> you know, we look at the example he gave. Uh, for prayer, but here is a prayer where Jesus is pouring his heart out. So if you have your Bible in the pew, we're going to turn to John chapter 17 this morning. And uh, we're also going to put the words on the screen if that's what you would prefer as well. And uh, the chapter begins, the first six verses, Jesus begins this priestly prayer. And he prays for himself about what he's about to face. And then we come down to verse 6. And he begins to pray for his disciples. And in this case, we're, he, we're talking about his 12 disciples, okay? This is who he's praying for first. So, John 17, starting in verse 6. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of this world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. And here's something interesting. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. And glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by the name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction. It's talking to Judas there. So that scripture would be fulfilled. 
I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they might have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be sanctified. Now that's a, that's a lot of reading there. But there's two things I want to highlight. Jesus prays two specific things for his disciples. First, that they might have joy, even in the midst of this world. And second, that they might be sanctified. And there's another one of those words that we throw out. What are we talking about? Well, in the Bible, when we talk about sanctification, it usually means one of two things. It's either to consecrate or set something apart, or it's to make something holy and pure. And commentators kind of wrestle with what did Jesus mean? Which of those two things? Was he saying he's setting his disciples apart? Or is he saying he's making them holy and pure? I'm suggesting this morning we don't have to choose and that perhaps Jesus meant both. Because he says he's setting them apart and he also talks about their holiness through the word of God. So he is sanctifying them. He's praying for sanctification for himself that they might be fully consecrated to the work of ministry and separated from all worldly concerns and that they might be holy and patterns of this holiness to whom uh, they will announce the salvation of God, they'll be an example of such. So let's continue. We just have a few more verses here. Now, we're going to transition here. When we get into verse 20, your Bible might have a heading that says, Jesus prays for all believers. So he's continuing his prayer. In verse 20 we read, My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, through the disciples' message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in, in, in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be as one as we are one. I and them and you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you have sent me and have loved them, even as you have loved me. So Jesus broadens his prayer here to include all believers. It's a prayer for you and for me and for this church. And so we come back around and we say, what is this unity that Jesus prayed for? It certainly was not in this passage a unity of organization. He doesn't pray that his disciples would found the biggest church, have the church with the smartest people, have the church with the best looking people. He doesn't pray for any of that. He prays that they would have a unity of personal relationship. That they may be one as we, Father, are one. It was this kind of unity for which Jesus prayed. It was the unity in which people would be able to love each other because they first loved God. By first uniting with Him and His person, we are creating the conditions in which we can establish a bond of unity with one another. We talked a lot about love the first few weeks. And if we're still being authentic, it's hard to love some people. And it's only through the gift of God and being united with Him and the Father that we're able then to extend that love to some people. Jesus and His Father are one in purpose. They're one in mind and character, but they're not one in person. They're distinct. This is unity. Uh, there is unity in their diversity. Likewise, the unity that exists between Jesus and His disciples is not one that will just... Uh, destroy the personality of the other. The first disciples we know were a very diverse group of characters. And as I look out across this room, I see a very diverse group of characters too. <laughs> they did not all think alike or process things in the same way, and they were not all given the same work to do. Each was given a role according to their very capabilities. And this, of course, is true for us individually and corporately. Experience tells us this. We can talk about being in one accord, but we know that we're individual people. We have different styles, we have different interests. And uh, I might be able to preach to somebody and have them respond in a certain way, but Matt might be able to get somebody to respond in a different way. Andrew might be able to sing a song a certain way and touch someone's heart. 
but Miles might sing in a different way and touch someone else's heart. And so the Lord assembled this group of diverse characters that they would be able to go into the world and reach all people. Experience tells us that Christians will never organize, organize their churches all in the same way. It will never be that they will worship God all in the same way. It will never even be that they will all believe precisely in exactly the same things. Even within tribes like Adventism, there's some variance of thought on some matters. But true Christian unity is a unity which transcends these differences and joins people together in love. The cause of Christian unity today and all throughout history has been hindered, injured, violated because people love their own churches, their own creeds, their own rituals more than they loved each other. When this happens, we are not keeping our eyes on Jesus. When we focus on man-made rules, religious tradition, regulations, and our preferences rather than Christ, two things can occur. First, our inward focus can create a condition where we are just, if I might use the word, ignorant <laughs> of what's going on around us. We're oblivious to the world around us. We're so focused on our own stuff that we're not paying attention to what's going on and thereby we, therefore we can't reach the world. In 1917, the Russian Orthodox Church was having a big convocation. They got all the bishops together and uh, there was some heated debate. There was some fussing, some feuding. And just a few doors down the street in one of the meeting halls were the Bolsheviks planning a revolution, planning to overthrow the Tsar. A revolution was afoot and it was the beginning of what we now know as the Communist Party. And there was the church just a few doors down in heated, hot debate about whether the candles should be 18 inches or 22 inches long oblivious to what was going around, going on around them. The second problem that occurs when unity is not present is perhaps more troubling, and it threatens the life of the church itself. Not long ago in an issue of National Geographic, there was a photograph of the fossil remains of two saber-toothed cats locked in combat. And I want to quote the article. One had bitten deep into the leg bone of the other a thrust that trapped both in a common fate. The cause of the death of the two cats is as clear as the cause of the extinction of their species. They could not survive because they were too busy fighting each other. And the same could be said of much of the church today. You know, we've stepped out to start this fellowship and it's been a wonderful experience. Uh, but in our broader community, there have been some that have been um, less than enthused <laughs> about what we're doing. And uh, <coughs> there are times when the criticism and, quite frankly, the misinformation <laughs> that has been is being spread about us uh, has called has caused me, and I know some others, but I'm just going to speak for me for a second, has caused me to become angry. And there are times when we're accused of doing something. Um, I'll give you an example. They'll say, <laughs> um, such and such a person was at your church. Why are you stealing them? And... Uh, you know, in three or four cases, such and such a person has never been here. <laughs> so uh, we're not stealing them. But, but sometimes there's this humanity that rises up in me that says, come on, Matt, let's go get those people. Let's steal them. <laughs> they, they already think we're doing it. Let's do it. <coughs> but when I read this passage this week, and I see Jesus praying for his disciples, and I see him praying for us, he doesn't pray that this church would hurt this church or that this church would be better or superior to this church. Other churches are not our competition. Amen. Jesus says the world is our competition. Amen. People aren't 
rolling out of a rack this morning and trying to decide hmm, which of these churches am I going, going to today? You know, there's a few. Some of you are here. But by and large, people are saying, yeah, am I going to go to the air show? Or the Apple Festival? Or to the mall? Am I going to go to work? Am I going to get out of bed? Am I going to play this game? Am I going to go here and do this? And when they turn to the church and look for a place where people are in harmony, where people have unity, so often they don't find it. So they go back to these counterfeits. They go back to that neighborhood bar, not just because there's alcohol flowing, but because it's a place of often of authenticity, where you can let the hair down, as it were, where you can talk and not have people be shocked. You ever seen the shocked church face when you, when you share with somebody something that's happened in your life and they, oh, <laughs> you know? I want this church to be unshockable, <laughs> okay? I want people to be able to come in here and be their true selves Amen. and have us not be shocked, <laughs> okay? So I don't know where it is, but now I'm getting off the soapbox and back. Let's get back here. Having unity to avoid these type of situations is important enough. But for Jesus, there was an even more important reason for us to be unified. Let's read this verse again real quick. Just verse 21. Now I'll back up to verse 20. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Okay? Jesus seems to understand that it's more natural for human beings to be divided than to be united. And real unity between Christians would be a supernatural fact that would require a supernatural explanation. And so Jesus, you know, we have these evangelism meetings. Matt's been to a few. But here's one of the most overlooked tools of evangelism. Jesus says when a watching world looks at a body of believers who are united, they will see something that they can't find anywhere else. In a world with its racial, ethnic, economic, and cultural divisions, unity captures attention. The people in the world are just like the people here in the church. They desire love, support, encouragement, and acceptance. And they will be drawn to Jesus by our example of unity. Jesus didn't say the world is going to be drawn because of great preaching. He didn't say great singing would cause hordes of people to be drawn to Christ. He said that unity will draw them to the gospel. You can't separate one aspect of the church. The greatest effect is realized when it's taken as a whole unit. Jesus' prayer was and is that we would be one, one in unity and love. God's family must be a place where we can be authentic and real. Matt covered that a couple weeks ago. It's a place where we forgive each other and care for those who may be different from us. It should be a place where we are committed to each other in love and where we find deep and lasting friendships. The family of God should be a place of freedom and not judgment and condemnation. I didn't get a lot of sleep this week, so I'm, I'm doing some editing as we stand here. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my wife gave birth to a baby just a couple weeks ago, so uh, no one in the house is getting much sleep. But, uh, She's been a great blessing to us. If we can only love people that we agree with, then we know little of the love of Jesus. He loved all kinds of strange, unlovely, and sinful people. If we can only love people that look and smell like us, then we know little of His love. If we cannot love imperfect people, then we know nothing of His unconditional love. If we can't love people who are different from us, then we might find that we only love ourselves. And if we can, if we can only love people who think like us, uh, believe exactly like us, uh, then we are not being true disciples of Jesus. Well, how do we foster this type of unity? 
What's our step? What do we do? I think first, based on this text, we need to acknowledge that love implanted in the hearts of men and women by God is what can tear down these barriers. And so we need to seek God's blessing first. We need to pray. Pray for unity. Jesus himself, he didn't snap his fingers. He prayed to his Father for unity. We need to practice it. You know, we don't, we're accused here of not talking about responsibility. But I'll use the word. It's our Christian duty to practice unity. Uh, we're so blessed to rent this facility, we didn't have to argue about the color of the carpet. We just showed up today and here it is. <laughs> right? Uh, practice it. You know, next time you're in that debate about the candle, and your candle is 18 inches, and somebody else's candle is 22 inches. Maybe let that one go. And present. We've been hovering right here, about 85, 90 people each week. It's time to go to the next level. It's time to start presenting what's happening here to our friends and our family and our community. So as you pray and as you practice, I want you to be thinking about who can you present this fellowship to? Who can you tell through your Facebook, at the job site, on the phone, if you still use those? <laughs> who can you tell about this community that's being developed here? Who can you invite to be with us next week and the week after that? The disciple. The disciple is the person who is commissioned to a task. As God sent out Jesus, so Jesus sends out his disciples. Jesus says he does not pray for the world, and yet he came into the world because God so loved the world, right there in the same book. In John's gospel, the term for the world often stands as an example of human society organizing itself without God. What Jesus does for the world is to send his disciples out into it in order to lead the world back to him and to make the world aware of God. And that word, don't let that slip by. To make the world aware of God. While we're here doing our thing, there are countless people, even here in the Bible Belt, who just are not aware of the richness and the blessings that God has in store for them. It is my hope that this church will be like a nut. Not just chock full of them. We're doing pretty good at that too. But that we would be a functional church. That is to say, one whose benefits will go far beyond any individual component. People won't just talk about the carpet, or the music, or the preaching, or the food that we normally have. That in our diversity, we will be unified. That our unique talents may all be under the control of the same spirit. A unity rooted in God's love, and one that serves as a witness to his supernatural power. Then the prayer of Christ for his followers will be answered. And the world will know that we are his disciples. Why? <laughs> because our unity is the most convincing proof to the world of the majesty and the virtue of Jesus. If you're looking for a place to call home, I hope you'll consider the Triad Adventist Fellowship. Because we are striking out and endeavoring to be a unified body as a witness to Jesus. May this fellowship give evidence of what the truth of God can do for those who love and serve Him. I want to leave you with a quote. It might stretch some of your Adventist box. <laughs> it's from St. Augustine. You may have heard it before. And he says this, In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. And in all things, love. <laughs>